I don't know, it's a pretty special thing getting to play music and having somebody else on that journey doing the same thing, being able to go through the trenches with you is quite, quite nice. Well, at uh, our school that I'm currently working at is a bring your own device school. So I think um, installing Spotify through the school systems and getting getting them to uh, stream my music on repeat for hours on end. I, I, I mean, it still won't make me much money, but it'll make me about eight more dollars than I'm getting from the streaming right now. So why not? Why not? To put that into, I suppose, a context, I think that might be three thousand dollars if the album's been streamed a million times and in two years when it probably cost me about 20 grand to record the songs for the album and to put about five grand into a big pr campaign and then pay my band to tour with me all right i'm gonna dump the camera sorry uh it's it's uh, i'm just shy um but no, I think it's it's gonna help. I think it's definitely gonna help with the connection. So I'll dump the camera, and hopefully that keeps our um, delay at a more manageable amount. Um, but Andy, we will just rip straight into it. We do have you, Andy Martin, with us here on Home Brewed, uh, and you're a great example to a lot of artists. We probably don't do enough of this in terms of promoting that artists. So many of the artists that we speak to just hit us up and go, hey, I'd love to have a chat. I've got new things coming out. And you are one such example of that. Andy, you're from uh, Brisbane. You saw some artists uh, that you know that we had featured in some capacity or another. And you thought, I'm going to reach out to these guys. You did that. And uh, here we are now chatting on the podcast. So first of all, welcome to Home Brood and thanks for reaching out. Oh, beauty. Thanks so much for having me on, Eamon and Cam. It's lovely to be able to chat to you both. So I figure we'll um, we'll start from the start with you, I reckon. You, you, you're with us because you've got some new music coming out that we are going to touch on. We're recording this on Tuesday. The new music is out tomorrow, Wednesday 9th of October, though this won't come out for a little bit but because you know you're you're from up in brisbane some of our listeners might not be familiar with you so just give us uh, the rundown on on who you are how long you've been doing it and what exactly you do uh, i've been doing it for a bit um i suppose the project that i am talking about with you is the andy martin project which is the solo thing that i've been running for about the last four years I Um, the music indie rock sort of space. Um, I've been, I suppose, gradually building like a bigger audience over time and playing with bigger artists over the last couple of years, especially, and um, had some success on radio and other stuff like that. So you know, I don't know if people have or haven't heard of me, um, probably haven't, but um, I've been do- doing the music thing for a while, indie rock, indie pop, guitar-based stuff, and yeah, it's fun. You mentioned that l- last year, you uh, this year and last year actually, you've been touring with some some big artists, and there are some big names on that list. There's the Rubens, uh, the Vans, Ben Lee, and of course the Central Coast's own the Moving Still. So, how have those experiences been with with for you? Sorry, as uh, you're developing as an artist, and how did that go? Just sharing the stage with acts like that, like playing with bands and artists like. Ben Lee and the Rubens and the Vans were artists who I've listened to for years and years. It was like, it was pretty special to be able to play those shows. Really, I really like appreciated every second of it. Um, and I think it's made me hungry for you to keep doing the music thing and keep pushing the music thing and all of that stuff. Because yeah, I suppose that was the ultimate goal was to play with artists that I really liked. And I've started to kind of be able to do that a little bit so that's been really cool and moving stills guys uh, absolute legends up in the lovely central coast 
You mentioned Ben Lee as one of those people that you've, you know, played with and, you know, we mentioned a lot of big names there and there have been plenty. I want to touch on Angus and Julia Stone in a little bit as well. So you've worked with some massive people within the Australian music scene, but Ben Lee is one in particular who has managed to stay relevant across a large period of time and has sort of his knowledge in the industry would be massive. Like, was there any one thing with Ben Lee, either the way he worked or just the way he was as a human away from music that is sort of stuck with you? Uh, he's very genuine and honest. So his songwriting is very honest and I feel like people can connect to him because of how true and genuine he is as a, I suppose, as a person, as an artist, and it all kind of fits into that same mould. And like when you, I don't know if you follow him across on the socials and stuff, but he's He's got a bit of a voice in the Australian music scene. It's kind of having a bit of a revival, and I feel like um, I feel like his voice is very. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll go back to that genuine thing, but I feel like it's very like valid and true, and I feel like he says it in a very uh, like in a quite an intelligent way, and he articulates his thoughts quite well. So I feel like the probably one of the reasons that he has stayed relevant is he writes great songs that are honest to him and true to him and people just can connect with that. You, It connects a lot with your music, I think, Andy, too, and I'm wondering is that obvious – I mean, obviously – being authentic is, is what most people like to think of themselves as and most people are, but your music has that honesty. And I don't know if it's just, um, well, it's not just, but if part of that is is how you present vocally in your songs, it's that um, not shying away from your your Australian accent, first of all, uh, but not even, it's it's very clear what, what even your talking voice is in the way that you sing, which is, uh, I think, authentic. And then, of course, the nature of your music generally uh, is is very reflective uh, and the the new single that's due out tomorrow at time of recording is also uh, very honest and, and authentic to yourself. So is that a direct thing that you've aspired to within your music and you want your music to reflect or is it just kind of the outcome of, of Andy Martin making music? Um, I feel like it's been a bit of a process generally with my songwriting especially. I feel like at the start when I tried to write songs it was normally down that like cringe love song vibe saying it didn't really feel that true I don't know and like I I I think I knew without knowing in a way like I'd I'd listened back to recordings and I wouldn't be like proud of the work that I was doing but I that, and I think that was quite a quite a, I suppose, like a revolutionary thing for me it's like well I should just write songs that are songs and <laughs> that kind of feel a little bit more uh, appropriate to my life and a little bit more genuine to me. Like I remember there's heaps of those singer songwriters that I've always like aspired to for that. But I remember listening to a, a very recent interview with Missy Higgins and she was saying like the last album that she released, she said like, it's not commercially like what the radio stations want. It won't get picked up by any commercial radio stations. She says, I feel like this is my best work. And all of the stories are so personal to me, but they somehow connect with other people. She said, if I was trying to write for the 40 year old divorced single mums, and if I was trying to write for that, I wouldn't be able to, because I was writing for stories that were personal to me. There's just happens to be people that can connect to that. So I feel like that's something that I, I suppose I'm aspiring to, but I feel like I'm just a bit of a, oh, I'm just a bit silly as well. And I just write kind of whatever I think and I just go from that. And I've, and I haven't had any, I suppose, like really bad experiences, but I definitely struggle with a lot of mental stuff. And um, I feel like it's a great escape for me to write about it as well. You mentioned Missy Higgins. She's another one who's just had an extended period of time of relevancy in the industry. And Ben Lee, I heard him on a podcast. He was talking about a similar thing to what Missy Higgins was talking about there, about not writing a song or an album just to please the labels or the publishers or the management. He was wanting to make music that he connected with and that he wanted to make. And he knew that... Yeah, sure, it might not have the commercial appeal that some of the other songs would have, but he knew that his core audience would actually appreciate it a lot more. And 
I think that's a that they're the right messages to be inspired by when it comes to making music, being authentic and you know, true to yourself, and especially in your genre too. Like you sing a songwriter, that's your benefit is that you can really get the raw emotions out there that, you know, a pop song or a metal song, they're there, but they're masked behind so many more layers. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things I've tried to always tell myself in writing music as well is um, if it sounds good just at the acoustic guitar, no matter what arrangement you do with it, it should be a pretty good song. So I think trying to take that mentality into songwriting as well which also means that you're going to scrap a lot of crap at the same time. Like you're going to be, you're going to be pretty hard on yourself and you'll know when you've written a verse or, you know, when you've written a little thing, you're like that's not cutting it for me. And then you'll just kind of stop with that idea completely. So I think taking the, taking the idea of if the bones of the song are there, no matter what you do with the arrangement, whether you want it to be more of a ballady song, whether you want it to be more of like an indie rock upbeat song, whether you want it to be a bit more, I don't know, like, intricate with what you want to do with the guitars or everything else if you have at its core that it's a pretty good song and it tells a story and it has it, like i said it has the bones there i feel like then that's kind of what i try to take in now especially like being a little bit more critical on yourself and have you always been sort of that singer songwriter uh guitar vibe because you mentioned the Andy Martin project at the beginning and going on your Instagram page the very first post is an album announcement so I don't know whether you've cleared everything off beforehand or whether this was just you worked on the project in the background and then bam here's a launch of a new project like tell us a little bit about Andy Martin the musician before Andy Martin the project yeah um well it's a I suppose it's a long story because music's always been a pretty big part of my life but not necessarily in the aspect that I'm doing it now or the genre that I'm doing it now or whatever you'd call it. But like I grew up playing brass music. Um, my, my, my main instrument still technically, well, the only instrument I've ever like trained on, I guess, is the trumpet. And I still, still play it a bit in live shows every now and then. I still play it on some of the recordings. Um, but I grew up playing classical music, brass band music and jazz music. And I always had this big invested interest in commercial top 40 music, which was so different <laughs> to what my, like my parents were listening to and what my parents were into. So I remember just, I remember like asking them for years and years. I'm like, I want a guitar. I want to get a guitar. I want to, I want to start singing. And they're like, all right, all right. And I remember one, I think it was maybe my 12th birthday. They got me this um, little Ashton, nylon string thingy with Bobby for about 50 bucks from the shop down the road. And I've still got her at home and I still play it every time I go home. But, um, and I just started, I started just writing songs and I started teaching myself how to play guitar. I just put the radio on and just fiddle around on the guitar and teach myself how to play. And then my, I suppose my interest and love for that music just grew more and more and more. Um, I just kept trying to play different instruments along to the radio and teaching myself different things. Um, and when I finished school, I went down and did some jazz study, um, music wise. And that was back still on the trumpet. And then I, um, one of my good friends down there, him and I started a band called handles and we moved back up to Cairns and built that up a little bit and played some cool shows and did some recording and stuff. And that was still in that like indie poppy, indie Rocky space, um, it's hard to cater to like five musicians where I was listening to like early singer songwriter music and then other artists in the band and people in the band were like, just like heavy metal lovers. And like, it was just a bit, sometimes it was a bit hard to write music that seemed genuine to all of us. Um, and in that time I moved back down to Brisbane and I just recorded a couple of songs and, and then I like sent them to the band and the band were kind of like, oh, I don't know, I'm not sure. And then I just thought, well, I'm just going to release these ones on my own and see what happens. And then the band slowly kind of like, I suppose, not like disbanded, but it was it was a pretty like intentional decision. There was people that were having a lot of like life things going on, whether that's with kids, whether that was, there was just lots of different moving parts. And I decided to keep pushing the solo thing. And I've still got original members of the band in my touring band as well. 
Yeah, I was curious about that specifically, about how <laughs> how you go about arranging these songs because from from what I can gather, you they start with you and an acoustic guitar, but obviously the recorded tracks sound like like with a whole lot of depth and obviously you can't be playing all of those instruments at once. So uh, are you writing every, every part of every song or is the band uh, still involved with kind of putting together how those different instruments interact with one another? And then of course you would have a, a band to tour with uh, as well as you mentioned. Um, I do the whole, the writing process is all me. Um, and it's normally just me and a producer in the studio. Um, I like to build the songs out from their bones and I like to, I suppose, be involved with all of the parts that are going on. I feel like in my head when I've written bits, I can hear the next bit that I kind of want to add in there or I can hear the next line that might work well on this and um, I can hear a melody that might shape itself well, whether it's on the vocals or whether it's with a guitar or something else. So I feel like I'm probably, it'd probably be hard for me to outsource those sort of things because I think I have like a, not necessarily a clear cut idea, but my process isn't necessarily rigid. I'm always changing what I'm wanting and how I want to do it. But um, the only thing I don't play on the tracks are drums and there's, that's a, there's, a, very, um, there's a very obvious reason why I do not do that. <laughs> And what is that reason? Oh, I cannot play the drums. <laughs> yeah. Yet, yeah. yet. Yeah. Oh, I tried to have a bash recently. Pretty average. Not very good. It's, it's funny, isn't it? Because the conception around drummers is, oh, it's not that hard. You're just banging, banging away. But to keep the rhythm and the tempo and to keep everything sounding good, you actually do need to be a good drummer. And a really good drummer can make a massive difference. Oh, yeah, it really, really does. And I think that was a big part of when I started this project and I started touring on like with my band and stuff. Um, my original drummer had lots of experience touring and lots of experience doing stuff. And he helped. He was really influential at the start in like helping program live sets and helping like, I suppose, not like managing director vibe, but he was very like, oh, this is how you can do this stuff. And I'm like, these are things that I hadn't even thought about. Or he's like, oh, this is how you might program this. Or, and he was just very, very professional, very onto his shit. And it like, um, it showed. And it, and it, it was just really good to work with someone like that, especially at the start. Because I'm like, oh, yeah, we can do these things. Like, th- things don't have to always be so hard. We can definitely like incorporate these things in our live sets. Um, yeah. Um, so he was really good at the start. He's moved over to South Korea doing other crazy things. But um yeah, I think um, having a good drummer is very, very influential in a band. And how do you go with the production side of things? I know you you worked with uh, Aiden Hogg for your most recent single as well, who's worked with G Flip, Hope D, H Jeffries, a bunch more. How much of that is your input and how much are you just leaving to the producers to do their work and work their magic? Um, it, it is a little bit of both i guess i think um there's nothing on the tracks that i didn't record in the studio so there's not much that goes on after the fact it's just a lot of fine tuning i guess and a lot of polishing of what we've already done and uh, and, uh, i suppose whether that's like doubling vocal effects whether that's doubling lines throughout it with a different kind of like paddle synth that are sitting on there so yeah it, it doesn't really change too much from what we do in the studio but definitely when i hear a bounce of the session versus aiden sending me a mix of the track there's a lot there's a there's obvious differences and like and it, and it sounds really tight and he's 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 made the songs what i wanted them to be without because i wouldn't ever be able to do that myself so that's a conscious sort of decision thing. to have everything be recorded in the studio and not you know a plug-in and a sound you know added in after the fact that's all conscious that's the way that you want your music to be produced yeah yeah 100 percent. i um i don't know i'm also pretty rubbish with technology and plugins <laughs> and all of the other stuff so i i um, i think it's just easier for me to be able to hear what it sounds like and play that in the studio um and yeah whether aiden wants to put a couple of effects on my vocals or on the guitars or 
make things sound a little bit more distorted or clean. Um, he's the one that has the ear for that and he's the one that knows how to do it with all the crazy software. So that's, um, that's that. yeah, I, um, I'm more than happy and really excited actually to work with other people and not have to worry about any of those side of things. I just get to play the instruments. Yeah, and it's a fantastic uh, group of people that, that you do work with. And, and if we can talk about this new single, Exactly Where I'm Supposed to Be, um, as we said earlier, it's Tuesday, 8th of October at time of recording. Uh, and this one comes out tomorrow, our time, but it will be mid last week by the time people are listening to this. But yeah, you recorded it with Aiden Hogg, um, our award winning producer who Cam mentioned earlier, mastered by Brock Weston, who's worked with Bugs, Eliza and the Delusionals and the Betty Ray. So that's a pretty impressive roster. And having listened to the track, uh, it is really, really nice. And it feels like, uh, a, like a step, I suppose I, w- I went back and I listened to, um, you know, music of yours from 2022, 2023, and now this one from 2024. And, it, and each, <clears throat> I, I actually really liked all of it, genuinely really liked all of it. I thought it was a really great sound, but each step felt like that authenticity we were speaking about a bit earlier or that on- honesty, not, not so much authenticity, honesty, I think, or, um, you know, that, that, that rawness in a good way, I think. And I feel like this new track, exactly where I'm supposed to be, is just another little step forward in that direction for you. Is, is that how you're reflecting on it as well? Yeah, that, there's definitely a part of that. And I think also the fact that I recorded a lot of the tracks from the album um, and the songs that you would have listened to from 2022, any time from like 2019 and 2020. So there is a big gap, like a four-year gap in terms of writing, recording and all of that stuff in the music. So I think I, um, I'm i leaning more into being honest as a songwriter and I'm really liking that. And I feel like a lot of the new music that's coming feels quite authentic to me and um, that makes me more excited about working on it and pushing it and all of that stuff. Um, but I think definitely... Definitely the authenticity thing is something that I'm trying a bit more to lean into, especially in, with my songwriting and with my stupid social media and all the other stuff that you got to do as an artist. And, and you mentioned it as a kind of a coming of age track is how you've referenced it in some of the stuff that you sent over to us. Um, and it's, it's touching on uh, internal struggles you faced over the past few years. So tell us a little bit about uh, what what this song means to you and, and kind of what it might mark moving forward to? Um, I think the whole sentiment of the song, exactly where I'm supposed to be, it's uh, that uh, the world and the lives that we lead aren't always going to go exactly the way that we think they're going to go. And I think the whole concept of the song is um, being comfortable with being uncomfortable or being comfortable in the fact that even though you thought you would be somewhere by this point, you're not. Another pain in my chest, I get an oppressed, I'm fading into this unconscious illusion. of not being my best when I'm so then get undressed. This world is built on foundations of confusion. Exactly where I'm supposed to be. And, um, but also where you are right now might not have been where you wanted to be a year ago, but it might be where you want to be now. And like, that's, it's just kind of leaning into that uncomfortability of not knowing what's coming next, but also the kind of excitement of what might be coming next. It's yeah. I don't know. I feel like when I was writing it, it felt just very true to me. And even in like the verses, you can hear changes in like the stories that I'm telling as part of the verses, whether it be quite negative, whether it be more on the up. And I think the chorus kind of exactly where I'm supposed to be was running blind. Now I clearly see this wicked game is all memories. So this wicked game is all memories is just touching on the fact that overthinking everything isn't always going to be the best way. And that um, the things that we're getting upset about or the things that we're struggling with 
might just be us thinking about things that have happened in the past that we were struggling with and that's constant cycle. So I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like the song just feels very true to me and it's not necessarily a happy one, even though it sounds like quite a happy song, but it's, uh, it just feels very honest. Yeah. Is that difficult or for you to sort of be that honest in a song and to sort of put the pen to paper when you're writing the lyrics and to try and just be, oh, I'm not going to hide behind any, you know, too many metaphors or, you know, oh, this is a story about a friend of mine. Like you being quite open about, you know, your experiences. Is that difficult for you to put that out into the world or is that just, you know, that's just your personality and you've sort of always had that open upbringing? Um. Well, I didn't really have an open upbringing generally. And I think that's why I enjoy the opportunity to share the stories that I do in my songs. And I also feel like um, my partner and I, who we've now been together for a few years, I feel like she helped me get a lot of those, like not necessarily like unpack some of those memories, but she helped me understand those emotions a little bit better and articulate those emotions a little bit better. And I think I feel more comfortable sharing those things in a way that feels authentic to me. And it, I also feel quite, uh, it, I don't know, a bit like quite freeing, like a, a little bit freeing, like writing it down in the actual songwriting process. And I think one thing that I used to think is that I once I write a song and I'm happy with a song, I should record it. But this is very much like I can just write songs and I love writing music for the sake of writing songs and writing music and I can feel better about things that are going on at the time by writing music. So, yeah, I think there's definitely been a few like key influential figures in that. But for some reason, I don't really find it as hard putting the music out because I feel like I've processed the emotion by the time I've written the song. So then everybody else can have that. I'm happy to be an open book and people can think that what they want or do what they want with it. But um, yeah, I'm happy to be an open book because I feel like I've gone through that situation or through that headspace or through that story in my brain. And you mentioned your partner there, Maisie Taylor, also a musician as well. How do you, do you guys yeah. collaborate with ideas back and forth or do you try to keep things separate? Like how does your dynamic work? Uh, we play in each other's bands. <laughs> okay. Good start. Um, and in terms of writing, she's a, uh, oh, drop the headphone. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I feel like she can articulate her thoughts a lot better than I can. Um, and I feel like that's something that I've, tried to aspire to a little bit more which is probably where the authenticity and the honesty is coming out in the songwriting now as well but in terms of working together um on all of the upcoming tracks and the last few singles Maisie's singing on them um we definitely chat about probably the structure of songs a bit she like she might say to me oh yeah i don't think you need to have that extra pre-chorus thing there or or like you could cut the first chorus in half and have this as a bigger thing at the end so like definitely having those chats about songwriting and i i I love just being able to do that we've been pretty busy with our own lives and other things going on but we used to do a, a fair bit of writing together as well and we like sitting down and playing through each other's songs and giving each other ideas and working with each other on the recording process and stuff as well. So I am, I actually love it so much. It's, it's so, it's so good. It's so good. How lovely. And like, isn't it nice? What, like what seems like a a very happy and healthy relationship can deliver in terms of, you know, like she's helped you uh, like express yourself and, and understand yourself and then put that into music. And no doubt you've helped her in ways that are similar and different as well. It's it's just so lovely that that's, that's how your relationship has flourished and it clearly works very well. Yeah. I think it's a pretty special thing. And when I think about it, I'm always pretty, I don't know, like stoked or humbled or I don't know. It's, it's, it's just a, I don't know, it's a pretty special thing getting to play music and having somebody else on that journey doing the same thing, being able to go through the trenches with you is quite, quite nice. And I think also just sharing a similar personality and being able to put that into our music. And we're both very supportive of each other, I feel, which is, which is, obviously hallmarks of a pretty good relationship so yeah i could talk about Maisie for days but <laughs> we, we can save that for another afternoon 
<laughs> it, it's it's uh, funny though because we've spoken to a couple of musicians who are also in relationships with other musicians, and some of them are, you know, they don't necessarily collaborate because their music can be quite different, but they can at least they appreciate what it takes to be a musician. So they know that if the other person's in a creative space, they know to give them that distance and to allow them to get their thoughts out on the page or to finish doing what they're doing. Because as we all know, as creatives, your little bursts come in random and wonderful times and often in the shower or when you're falling asleep at night in the most inconvenient of times. But you know, these little bubbles come and you go, okay, I need to, while I've got the energy, I need to get it out because if I wait 20 minutes to finish this TV show or whatever the case is, then it could be gone and then you're back to square one a little bit. So there are so many aspects apart from the actual music, but just life in general, they understand working weekends and nights and the, the different schedules that it takes. Like it, yeah, there are so many benefits that can occur when you're both on the same wavelength as it appears that you and Maisie certainly are. Yeah, totally. And I feel like we, I don't know, just the fact that we want to go to see each other's shows every time because we like each other's music, like that, that, that's a pretty cool thing. Um, and I feel like with Maze playing in my live band now, just, I don't know, I don't really think about the shows that much in a way. Like I'm just feeling like pretty comfortable. It's a pretty um, cool hangout for you and your partner yeah, playing yeah, on stage yeah, it's together. A really, it's, a re- it's a really cool hangout, really cool hangout. And in terms of those shows, uh, by the time this one airs, or well not airs, we're not Jeez. radio anymore, by the time this one is published, is released, <laughs> I don't know, what do we call it? Um, uh, you will have played a couple of, of the tracks, sorry, the shows that accompany this new release, exactly where I'm supposed to be. The most relevant one that would have been uh, for our <laughs> listeners <laughs> will be uh, was in Sydney uh, on Saturday, October 12th, but you will have one coming up in your home hometown or home state of Brisbane uh, this upcoming Saturday, October 19. What can people expect from those shows and and what are you bringing to those shows? Um, I'm supporting an artist who I believe is from the Central Coast, Patrick James. He's from Port Macquarie, maybe a little little bit further north. Um, But yeah, I'm supporting him on his upcoming album tour, which um, this is coming out next week. So his album would be two weeks old at this stage. Um, We're all but, doing um, <laughs> quick week maths. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm supporting Patrick on um, a few dates. So we did um, just uh, the East Coast show, so Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane. We're playing in Sydney last weekend. Um, people can expect. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> we know what you're saying, but just the sentence, we played, or oh, like we're playing in Sydney last weekend as a sentence. <laughs> yeah, should not work, good, eh? but it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's going to be pretty strict back sets. It's going to be probably, it, I think Maze has come down with me for Sydney to sing, which is nice. Um, so it'll just be two guitars, stripped back, acoustic sets, harmonies, um, the bare bones of the songs, which is always really fun to share with people, especially when you're supporting an artist that is more in that singer songwriter, indie pop space where the the instrumentation might be a little bit more stripped back so that people can really listen to the lyrics and what's going on. So I love playing in those sort of environments. So people can inspe- expect a pretty chilled out Andy at the next couple of shows. Um, yeah, and I've got I've got a couple of band ones coming up towards the end of the year, which will be a bit more bit more raucous, Andy. Yeah, give us a rundown of what the, the band shows look like and, and are you able to preview any of those dates as well? Um, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a dog and say, no, I can't. I'm, <laughs> no. Uh, I, uh, no, November, I'll be down, down your way at some point. Not sure if it'll be um, start or end of November on those shows. Um, but uh, the full band show, I don't know, just fun energy. It's like multiple guitars jumping around. Um, the songs as pretty much you hear them on the records, um, maybe a little bit of embellishing in terms of like uh, fluffing around on some intros or some big outros or a bit of yelling at the end and stuff like that. So I, I, I really like the shows to be high energy and fun and exciting and I really want people to take away from it that we love what we're doing. 
it's good that you do like what you're doing. And I think it shows from your passion and enthusiasm with the way that you're talking about it as well. You said down our way, which of course is the Central Coast, but we are broadcasting, obviously, the podcast it's anywhere you want to listen to us but we are also broadcasting on oz indie radio as well which has its roots up sort of cans and up in queensland as well so um if you're listening on that platform and you're up in that area as well check out uh, andy martin or if you're in sydney or down our way as well check him out when he comes into town um i mentioned a while ago that I wanted to touch on the Angus and Julia Stone sort of mentor session thing. How yep. did how did all this come about? Uh, they chucked out a call for artists and uh, it was through a Wild Turkey sponsorship um, and they just said, like, send us your stuff. We'll be going through all of these. We'll be going through all of these applications and if you get in, you get a free week down in Sydney and you get to work on songwriting and get to work in crazy studios and showcase in front of a bunch of industry people and got to play with them on one of the nights and stuff, like some pretty epic things going on. I just applied for that and I, I got a got an email saying, oh, Julie is about to jump on the Zoom call in half an hour. Are you free? I was like, oh, yeah, of course. And they're like, you have to, and they're like, oh, you're free to come down to Sydney in three days. And I was like... I guess so. <laughs> how does I'll, I'll, I'll make it work? How does I want to hear more about this? But how does that sort of work with your schedule? You said to us right at the start that you're a school teacher. So how does that go with? Oh, hey, by the way, I'm going to Sydney in three days. Peace out. Oh yeah, it's not not a fun chat, <laughs> and um, like I, I'm sharing a class with another teacher. And um, the funny thing was because so that I, I suppose I've got a little bit more space to do other stuff. But, um, yeah, I was sh- I'm sharing a class with another teacher and we'd sat down the day before it to do um, – we to chat about the term and about our planning stuff and, like, literally, like, hours before that call. And then I called her up the next day. I'm like, I'm so sorry. Like, <laughs> I, I said, this has popped up. Can we meet? I'm, like, I'm happy to do all the planning stuff, but I won't actually be able to be at class next week. Are you free? Or she'll be I'd contact us. Like, so, <laughs> yeah, and she's just like, oh, really? <laughs> so, that, 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 was a bit, that was a bit of a – yeah, it was a bit of a rough one. And it's hard because I totally understand and the kids are a huge priority or they're – the, the priority in that in that situation so it's it's not always an easy chat and it's not easy to try and do music and other i suppose emotionally and time consuming things at the same time there are so many casual teachers just cursing you right now for <laughs> Or maybe yeah. they're cheering you because maybe you're giving them a, a day's work but um, <laughs> what 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 year do you teach I've got a year 4 class Year four. Is that a, I imagine that'd be a pretty good age because they're competent enough with a lot of the learnings, but they're not at the age where they, you know, I'm the big fish of the primary school and I own this place. Uh, they're, it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool bunch. Um, cause they still do have that innocence about them, I guess. Um, and I don't know, but it's funny. Hey, like some of the, some of the kids will be like telling me about these TikTok things. I'm like, you guys are like nine years old. Like that. Yeah. I, don't, I don't say that to them. It's like, oh yeah. All right. But Any of your students like, see oh, your you videos sure? that you put out? Oh, I don't know. I, um, I hope not. I try to keep, I try to keep that pretty separate. <laughs> yeah. It's hard because a, like, a lot of my mates that are teachers, they're all, you know, obfuscating and, and changing their names and confusing their social media presences and things like that so um if the kids found your music i suppose it would be a bit easier for them because you've got a profile yeah i I don't know i feel is that more of a high school thing i think so well hopefully it's more of a high school thing (laughs) maybe towards the end of primary school the kids are getting a bit uh like interested and having a having a geese and seeing (laughs) seeing what their teachers might be doing outside of class having a bit of ammunition against them (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, the algorithm you never know what these kids are going to be served oh. up and maybe they see yeah. your face and go what mr barton yeah i know yeah, I, know. I know it's funny hey I, I i try not to think about it too much i know that <laughs> well I, I play music with them in class and stuff so they know that music's definitely a big part of me and i'm trying to like show that to them but um 
I haven't had any risque friend requests on Facebook or some rant or not that I know of some um, random followers that have popped up from my class as of yet. So touch, touch wood that that won't be a, a thing that I have to deal with in the not too distant future. You're safe for now, but it's also an unreal opportunity for you as an artist to just propaganda your music throughout every school and every class, you know, just go off the syllabus and go handing out CDs to every one of your students, take it home, show your parents, um, threatening bad marks if they don't listen to your music or create an army of bots to listen to your music and things like that. So just a bit of food for thought there. Yeah, um, no, I'll take it. I'll take it. Well, it, uh, our school that I'm currently working at is a bring your own device school. So I think, um, Installing Spotify through the school systems <laughs> and getting getting them to uh, stream my music on repeat for hours on end. I, I, I mean, it still won't make me much money, but it'll make me about eight more dollars than <laughs> I'm getting from the streaming right now. So it'll why not? A couple not? of coffees throughout the week, you're fine. Yeah, <laughs> or just or just. I wish the uh, the check in thing was still a still a go from COVID, so people could just be banging QR codes all throughout the school. Just change them all yeah. to your Spotify page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, you're you're good business people. I can tell. <laughs> 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 it's interesting you, you reference the streaming there, and we have uh, we also do like a, a music news podcast uh, fortnightly as well. One of our more recent ones, we talked about um, a man who defrauded Spotify of ten million dollars by creating an army of bots to listen to AI generated songs, and uh, it we were kind of. In our reflections on it, we were, we were touching on the fact that, you know, how poorly artists are paid for that. And we know for you, um, your, was it a 2019 album? The one with the track Reverie on it, apologies. Oh, yeah, um, 2022. 2022, sorry. Uh, that album clocked up over 1 million streams. And I suppose for that reference point for people still listening, in my mind, if you've had a million streams on your music, you should be able to retire. <laughs> uh, but of course, that isn't the reality for artists and it really does highlight why there is just a huge divide between uh, the consumption and the amount that the artist actually ends up within their pocket. Oh, one million streams should be one million dollars, right? That just that dead that, set. That 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 seems that seems like the right the right fit. Um, but yeah, it's it's unfortunately not around. Not 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 that much money. It's um more like the figures that you'd see everybody sharing, like zero point zero zero three cents per stream. And to put that into, I suppose, a context, I think that might be. Three thousand dollars if the album's been streamed a million times, and in two years when it probably cost me about twenty grand to record say. the songs for the album and to put about five grand into a big PR campaign and then pay my band to tour with me on the album tour, um, it's it, it you, you're not even recouping your costs, which I don't think I'm trying to do necessarily, but it's just to put it in the context of. Mm. Being an independent musician, it's um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. Do you do much merch? Um, yeah, I've got merch. I, I do that at shows. Um, that's one of the ways that you can, I suppose, recoup some of those costs as well, um, especially touring. Yeah, for reference, you don't need to give us exacts, but I'm just curious. What do you have a percentage split with the merch company? Do you buy the merch and then sell it and keep a hundred percent? Like I'm just trying to get a an idea of obviously Spotify streams, you're getting pittance, other different, you know, ways of generating income. You might be earning a different percentage of or having a split of. We hear merch and CD sales are some of the or probably not CD, probably vinyls more, which is a funny how that's now the more relevant <laughs> medium, but it's yeah. you know, they those are the best ways to support musicians. So What's in, I guess, a, a split term? If you don't want to give us exact figures, no, I can, I, open book. Um, tell you anything, all the secrets. Um, <laughs> I, with all of the music stuff that I do, I foot all of the costs up front, and that's kind of the way that I've always done it. So, 
it, it means that I'll be in the pits for a bit, but it, um, but slowly those costs will hopefully recoup. And then it gets to a point where you're like, oh, it's like free money after a year if I haven't sold all of these other things. Because like, <laughs> I haven't even been thinking about that for a while. So it's a forced saving by spending a lot of money on merch. Um, but yeah, merch stuff is all, I'll just pay for it all up front and try and recoup the costs from live shows and people buying it. Um, C- CDs, uh, dying trade. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, um, no, they definitely are. That was a, um, I, I guess just thinking about a physical medium is better than a streaming, but I cannot remember yeah. the last CD I bought or the last time I even picked up a CD to play it. Yeah, I think um, if you're thinking, if we're trying to put things in context with streaming, if I sell a shirt for 35 bucks, which cost me 18 bucks to make, so 17 bucks on a shirt for me to make $17 on streaming, I need to get about 10,000 streams. So somebody needs to listen to my song like 10,000 times um, or they can just buy a t-shirt. <laughs> that's, 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 yeah, it's, it's a pretty, it's pretty wild when you actually think about the numbers and <laughs> all yeah. of that stuff that goes on with it. And the hours is, involved for me to sit there yeah. and listen to a song 10,000 times. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty big um, commitment. I'll tell you what, my hourly rate is uh, $35 for just to pay is uh, a bit better. <laughs> yeah, if, if, my, if your hourly rate was 35 bucks and you listen to my three-minute song, you're going to be making a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> you're not listening 10,000 times, that's for sure. <laughs> it is insane to hear it in that perspective. Uh, it's actually the first time we've ever heard it in that perspective, mm. I think. So, thank you for offering that insight as well and, and kind of being an open book in that regard. It's um, it's crazy and I feel like I, I suppose the more people that are more acutely aware of this, perhaps the, the more likely we might be able to see some form of change there because you certainly deserve it. Like the <clears throat> if, if – a song is heard 10,000 times or listened to 10,000 times, its impact, you know, is obviously huge. And it isn't just one person listening to it 10,000 times. It's thousands of people listening to it. Uh, and to, to reach that many people with your music is a feat in itself, let alone a million over an album. And you should be absolutely recuper- uh, remunerated better. <laughs> remunerated. God, don't that say word. this word again. Remunerated, yeah. remunerated. You're a teacher. <laughs> Andy, which yeah. one is it? <laughs> um, uh, uh, you should be re- remunerated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, you should be remunerated better. See, but didn't we Google uh, it and it was the other way around? It was remunerated? Oh, it depends on, it depends on the context. Uh, remuneration will be like your salary packet. We, we, we can go into this on, a, on another call if you want. No, do it now <laughs> because we've been stumbling over this word so many times. So, if you can just clarify it once and for all, it's getting the Google open. <laughs> yeah, well, um, we've got you remuneration as the uh, an act or fact of re- remunerating. So that is um, recompense pay. So that I think uh, I think um, if we go to the REM, that's you guys. One point, okay, so one, we'll- one point homebrewed, zero points Andy. Either way, you were the one that's found us the actual the meaning for it, and I'll, we will hopefully remember this better now. But either way, you should be remunerated better than the cost of recording perhaps one song for an album. Yeah. You know, the, it, when you are, when that whole album is he- heard one million times. Yeah, it, it, I suppose. That the, unfortunately, that's the landscape and. The other thing is like um, because Spotify have such a monopoly on the streaming market, it means that you kind of have to be on there anyway for people to hear your music. So they've kind of got you by the by the gonads, and they're unfortunately for artists like you kind of have to be on there even if you are wanting to be stark and be like, no, I'm not going to do this. Just go to my band camp and buy my album there. You might have like 20 or 30 people do that, but then they have to download their download the album onto their computer and then they have to listen to a service outside of Spotify and it doesn't have the algorithms inbuilt that you'll find music that you might not have been able to even find if you weren't looking in those places. Like there's definitely 
I suppose, positives in terms of the platform, but the negatives are the repercussions for the artists using the platform. Yeah, they've just created this massive beast where, yeah, as you say, you have to be on there or else you're not going to get the exposure. You know, you might come across someone's Discover Weekly and then they become a big fan of your music as a result because the algorithm just knows that you are right up their alley. Um, and ultimately, you even though you're getting less per stream, you're still going to be making more money on Spotify than selling through Bandcamp just because of the large quantity of numbers. So it sucks but it is still worthwhile putting it up there. And it, you almost have to, almost like you mentioned TikTok and social media and how that is now a part of being a musician. It's the same sort of argument. Like if you're not on TikTok, you're not getting that exposure. It could potentially impact your career. Yeah, which sucks. But and yeah, like you <laughs> said, unfortunately, it's just a bit of the nature of the beast at the moment. Um I feel like the whole climate and culture around live music has had a bit of a shift over the last few years as well. Um, and uh, like a, there's been a big downturn in people like buying drinks and drinking out at gigs, which is not necessarily a bad thing at all. Um, but in terms of venues being able to offer artists big guarantees at the start to be able to get them on shows, um, to be able to kind of kickstart careers, they're unable to do that because they're unable to pay they aren't able to pay the bands of X amount because they're not making any money from bar sales. And there's like a flow on effect of COVID and people being more comfortable staying in than going out and all of those sort of things that play into the live music thing. So I think any advice for any listener is just go watch music and go listen to music and go appreciate music, especially if you have friends that do music. Um, if you have friends in the industry and you have friends that are trying to not necessarily make it, but friends that are just playing live music, I think your support of them means more to them than you think. Like it is like a really special thing having people that, you know, come to your live shows and appreciate what you're doing, I guess. And that's uh, very great advice from the horse's mouth there too. We we preach the the go to shows thing all the time, but it's I think it cuts a bit uh, a bit firmer when it comes from an artist themselves. So, um, Andy, thank you for that. And before we we do wrap up, I did want to touch on the Brisbane and Queensland music scene generally right now. You're obviously. Uh, up there in the belly of the beast. How do you rate it? Because we hear a lot of good things and uh, the Valley uh, generally sounds like it's a very good place to go out and see live music. There's some p venues that I've seen uh, in and around Brisbane that look unreal as well. So how do you rate everything going on up there right now? Yeah, it's pretty cool. There's heaps of cool venues up here. Um, I feel like Brizzy does have a bit of a thing going on. Um, I think the one thing that is good and bad about um, the Valley is there's lots of live music venues. Um, so there's your spoilt for choice and even like spoilt for genres. Like if you want to go and see an indie rock band versus a metal band versus a pop singer songwriter, like there are avenues for all of those types of artists every Friday and Saturday out in the Valley. Um, and there's just a heap of beautiful rooms that have popped up over the last few years as well. Like the princess theater and the fortitude music hall, like the, putting on pretty crazy shows and I think they are still quite well attended, which is nice. It means that they can keep doing the thing and keep putting on those sort of shows. So I feel like there's a bit, there's a bit of a vibe. There's a bit of a vibe up here. Um, um, there's stuff, there's stuff going on. Um, and yeah, I feel like um, people should come and tour Brizzy because even though they're last minute ticket buyers, they're loyal. But that, that's not just a breezy thing. That's something that we've seen be nationwide since the pandemic is that people are buying tickets yeah. later, which is obviously impacting a lot of festivals that have been cancelled and moved around uh, this year and also with just touring as well. On that note, what do you make of some of the bigger, I guess, international acts leaving Brisbane off their East Coast and Australian tours? It's always just Sydney and, and Melbourne. Oh, de it depends on if it's a, probably an artist that I would be upset about not seeing in Brisbane, I guess. <laughs> I think um, I just, um, if, I don't know, if it's not an artist that I really would probably fork the couple hundred bucks out to see, 
I don't think it affects me that much, but I know that it is an issue for a lot of people in Brisbane, like with the Taylor Swift thing or with Thank like you for Oasis. The obligatory just, reference. With, uh, with Oasis coming back and touring, they're just doing Sydney, Melbourne. And like, I know that Brisbane would have loved a show and they would have sold out a show here. But um, the belly the belly of the beast, the big dogs, they probably have, um, they probably have uh, contracts in place that are like, it would be more exclusive or you could sell five shows in Melbourne, which would make you more than five shows in Brisbane or something like that. Because they'll probably do a, they'll probably sell out their shows quickly and then they'll announce other shows and they'll do a week of shows and they'll make more money than if they came to Brisbane, even on one of those shows. How do you think that impacts the local music scene in Brisbane, not having a Taylor Swift or Oasis, having a show there or does it not really impact the local scene too much in your opinion? Um, I feel like if people, I feel like those pop stars have such a huge market in the industry that they could sell out a show in Sydney just of Brisbane people flying down to Sydney to go and see them. I feel like um, if artists are of that size, people are just going to drop everything and make it work no matter what. Um, Not to say that that's not not a bad thing and I think that, It'd be amazing if international artists were to do bigger runs of shows. But I think the costs of touring are pretty wild. And that's why like someone like Taylor Swift playing five nights at one venue only has to get all of the gear to that venue once. So the whole like logistical cost of her coming up to Brisbane to play a big show, for example, probably isn't worth it. And I think um, she does the whole Stark thing and she's very like, well, I've got the I've got so many fans, so I can play a show wherever, and people are going to rock up, and people are going to sell them out in minutes. So, Is yeah, a- I think it's not a, not a good thing for the local scene, no. But I feel like, unfortunately, there are lots of costs in touring, and people are going to go for the pay packet usually. Is there an element of a lack of government investment? regarding that as well because and i don't know too much necessarily about these you know exclusive tours but we're going to bring a sports reference so apologies to any of our non-sports fans but the socceroos play quite a bit in queensland as do the matildas and that's because the state government are paying to have them play a game at suncorp stadium i don't know whether there are similar deals for musicians but do you think that there is a lack of state government support in Queensland to try and get some of these artists around or are they more focused on the local scene? Like what's your take on that? Uh, Queensland values sport a lot higher than a lot of other things. I think like using the sport reference is like a pretty clear cut example of that in play. Um, I know that WA, um, they did a similar thing with the Coldplay show that was there. Um, in Perth, I think it was like a year ago, Coldplay came and did a one-off show and it was only in Perth. And I think that was all state government basically funded. Um, So I think uh, governments can do a lot more generally in terms of funding for individual artists, for festivals, for like for management companies, for booking agents, for venues, for all of the above, like the fact that insurance costs for venues have gone up like by four times in the last five years because insurance companies like, well, if they go and if they go gangbusters or if they have to cancel a show, we have to foot the cost of that. So it's all like a flow on effect of all of these things. But I think government intervention is one way that might ease the pain of what's going on, I guess. And it will ensure that like, for example, like I was saying with venues selling drinks to be able to put on guarantees for shows if there was intervention from government which was we will give x amount which will cover off this amount of shows whether it's like a thousand bucks for a friday night and you can put on two or three bands and that would be every every week that's nothing for them that means absolutely nothing for them but it means that the live music scene can kind of get kick-started again i guess yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, the governments can do a lot. I, su- I suppose the flip side of the n- lack of international acts visiting Brisbane is that much like we saw in WA during COVID, 
perhaps it means there's a lot more opportunity for local artists to get on stages and a lot more opportunity for people who might otherwise be saving their bickies for those shows or, or just at those shows on that night to be able to go and support some of the bands that are, are touring and playing locally too which is is a good thing for the the music that we certainly support but of course if you're a fan of that international act then it it is a bummer to not have that opportunity to be able to see them and also i think like on that point as well there was a lot of controversy that came with the taylor swift shows going back to that with her not having even having a look in for an opener from any of the australian cities and yeah, Sabrina Carpenter is a huge artist, which we can all see now as well. But the fact that um, international artists are still bringing over international artists <laughs> to play in Australia, like I, um, I get it because I'm assuming that they're on the same record label or I'm assuming that there's something else bigger at play going on there. But I feel like governments can have those interventions and policies in place that are if artists are playing those size shows that they can have locals on the bill or like they can start the show an hour earlier and they can have a local artist open it up in each city or something along those lines i guess because even the promotion costs to the local artists jumping on that show from your performing rights authorities and stuff like that are very helpful for people that are starting out yeah, and even in a, a previous music news, we did cover Michael's rule, which is uh, only yeah. up for voluntary adoption at the moment, but uh, was at one point legislated, I think, at least in New South Wales, that they have to actually have a, a local artist open. I think something like that would be super easy and fantastic way uh, to to get some of that going. But if we can round things out, Andy, with, with your music and your journey, we do have this new single, Exactly Where I'm Supposed to Be. We've been talking about it. Uh, it's out in the world. You're going to release it last week uh, and we what what's to come after this what have you got planned uh, are there more releases you mentioned that there definitely are more shows what can we expect for you in the next six to twelve um oh well lots of i've been in the studio doing a fair bit of work um and ideally it'll be staggering releases out next year um with the whole with the whole doing a career outside of music and doing music at the same time, I have to be quite organized with that stuff. So like having, I've got a pretty clear structure for how at least the first half of next year is going to roll with shows and releases and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I've booked, um, I've booked a tour for April next year um, with my own music and a new single that'll be coming out around the same time. Um, just basically getting as many songs down as I can and then I'll decide whether it's like a just release a few singles, whether it's a try and work on another album, whether it's a release a couple of EPs and two of those in different capacities. Um, But long story short, lots of shows, lots of music, lots of fun things. Wonderful. We look forward to it all, Andy. Thank you so much for taking the time and – being so patient through some of our earlier technical issues, which hopefully the audience have no idea about because the edit has been so clean and easy. But we really do appreciate you taking the time and for being so open and you know honest with us and giving us some really great insight into not just what's happening there in Brisbane, but, you know, I guess widely across Australia and some of the industry insights that, you know, we don't necessarily always get to hear. So we really do appreciate your openness and it's a testament to yourself and it flows on to the music that you're making as well. So lovely. Thanks, Cam and Eamon, and uh, have a killer rest of your last week. And um, I'll, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure I'll chat to you guys soon. Thank you so much. This episode of Home Brewed, the amazing episode that it was, was produced by my good friend Eamon Snow. It was recorded on Darking Jung Land. And for more from us, head to www.homebrewed.au.